Now, the Shia sources indicate that when the Prophet conducted the Pact of Brotherhood, the Mu'akhat between the Muhajireen and the Ansar, he assigned Abu Dhar to be the brother of Salman. And he instructed Abu Dhar to never disobey Salman. Some sources also indicate the Prophet also assigned him as a brother to Al Miqdad. We'll talk about Miqdad soon. Salman was praised by the Prophet. One of the praises that he earned from the Prophet was at the Battle of Khandaq or the Battle of the Trench. Basically, the Prophet at this incident at the Battle of Khandaq, what happened at the Battle of Khandaq is you had thousands of people in massive armies gathering to fight Islam and uproot the Muslims. This is in year five or six of the Hijrah. It's called Battle of the Ahzab also. Now what happened is the Jewish tribes in Medina, they committed treason by sending sensitive information to the pagans who had come to fight the Prophet. Medina was vulnerable, especially from the northern side. The northern side was populated by the Jews. So the Jews actually made a deal with the enemies of the Prophet that will give you access from the north, enter Medina and destroy all Muslims. That way we get rid of this Prophet and this religion. This is after what? They signed a treaty with the Prophet. If you remember, we talked about the document of Medina, that they would not commit treason, they would not betray the Prophet and the Muslims, they violated this agreement. So the Muslims were now surrounded by massive armies. They were like what, 900? And on the other side you have thousands, in fact over 10,000 fighters who've gathered. Now the entire population of Medina was not more than maybe 2,000. Now imagine if you have 10,000, they could uproot the city. So the Muslims lost hope. What are we going to do? At that battle of Khandaq, Salman comes up with an idea. He says in Persia, when this would happen to us, we would actually create a ditch a trench, a massive trench that's several yards deep, several yards wide and miles, miles long that would surround the whole city. So those areas of Medina that were vulnerable to attack, the idea was to dig a deep, deep trench that would surround the, Medi the city of Medina. Now the enemies could not have physical access to Medina. How are they going to go over the trench? It's so wide and big. Their horses, their transportation, they can't cross it. It's, very, it's impossible for them to cross it. The Prophet loved the idea. He told him, Salman, that's a fantastic idea. Let's adopt this idea and let's all work on this trench. So the Prophet assigned companions certain distances and parts of the trench to dig. And Salman really had that honor. Now at that battle of the trench, when the companions saw that Salman's idea saved them, the Muhajireen said, Salman is one of us. The Muhajireen are the migrants, those who came from Mecca. The Ansar, the people of Medina said, no, Salman's one of us. They want to claim the victory to themselves. So they were disputing, Salman's from us, Salman's from us. The Prophet comes and says, Salmanun minna ahl al-bayt. Salman's not from you, wala the Ansar, wala the, the Muhajireen. Salman is one of us, the Ahl al Bayt. Imagine the statement coming from Rasulullah. Salman is one of us, the Ahl al Bayt. That's just amazing. And Salman really did have that wonderful status in the eyes of the Prophet. Now, because Salman was Persian, he came from uh, Persian ancestry. There was a lot of racism that was aimed at him. He was the target of racist remarks. It has been narrated that one day Salman entered the majlis of the Prophet, a gathering in which the Prophet was there, because the companions knew how much the Prophet loved him and how high ranking he was. They glorified him, they respected him a lot and they gave him the best seat in the majlis next to the Prophet. Some people entered the majlis, they saw this Persian man sitting closest to the Prophet and having a very distinguished status, more than a lot of the Arabian uh, com companions. 
So they made racist remarks and they say, they said, Man al-Arab? Who is this Persian who's put himself amongst the Arabs? He said that racist remark. <coughs> the Prophet became upset. So he got up on the minbar, on the pulpit. The Prophet says, all people since the day of Adam are equal. And he gave the example of a comb. Have you seen a comb? In Arabic, we call them asnan al misht. What do you call those things in a comb? The needles, what do you call them? Teeth. Teeth? Yeah. Bristles. Bristles. Bristles, teeth. If you've seen a normal comb, like the, you know, not those round ones, historically, like the normal combs, the teeth or the bristles are of equal height. The Prophet says, You human beings are like that. You're all equal. لا فضل لعربي على عجمي. No Arab man should think that he has a virtue over a non-Arab man. Only taqwa is what counts. Only piety. Then the Prophet says, سلمان بحر لا ينزف or ينزف. Salman is an ocean that's never ending. وكنز لا ينفد. He's a treasure that never ends. Salman minna ahl al bayt. Salman is from us ahl al bayt. I don't want to hear any any of these racist remarks. So Salman was truly a wonderful, wonderful companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa He played an, an instrumental role at the time of the Prophet, after the Prophet. By the way, one hadith states one day he went to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And he told him, I'd like to propose and marry your daughter. Omar said, uh, no, he apologized. You know, you're, you're not Arab and this is just not customary for us. So he had, you know, that tribal mentality still that he's not Arab, he's not qualified. Salman tells Omar ibn al-Khattab, he tells him, look, I didn't really want to propose to your daughter. I just wanted to test you to see if you still have that rigid Arab mentality of being racist, racist and tribalist and unfortunately you still do. <laughs> so sometimes you know he would test some of these companions to teach them you know not to be so arrogant. Salman was on, amongst the very few companions who was loyal to Amir al-Mu'mineen at Saqifah when the whole coup d'etat happened, the Ahl al-Bayt were marginalized. The Salman was a staunch supporter of Amir al-Mu'mineen and he would always tell the Imam, give me the signal, I'll do whatever you want. And he would always remind this Ummah that you've lost by abandoning Ali ibn Abi Talib. If you were to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib, this world would have turned into an oasis of peace, a paradise for you. And he would really feel regretful that they uh, did this to him. Now at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, when he becomes the Khalifa, he appoints Salman the governor of Madain. Madain is a city in modern day Iraq, not too far from the capital Baghdad. Now Salman did not recognize the legitimacy of those who took the Khilafah from Imam Ali. So he goes to Imam Ali and he tells him, you know, Omar is pushing me to be a governor in that region. What do you say? He went to seek permission from Imam Ali. Imam Ali gave him special permission. He told him, yes, go. You're a man of God and you can help a lot of people over there. Yes, maybe the overall rule is not the rule of the Prophet but you are a trustworthy man. Go and serve Allah in that community. So he gets special permission from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and he accepted to be the governor. There were about 30,000 Muslims under the governorship of Salman at the time when he went. Salman never took advantage of his position as being a governor. In fact, he would work with his bare hands to make some cheap items and sell them so he would make a living. He would not accept to take a salary from the Muslim treasury. Even sources indicate that he was very, very humble. He never really owned much. One, uh, one historical account or hadith states a natural disaster happened in Madain. I think, I think the hadith says a fire broke out in Madain and people were in their homes trying to salvage their valuable belongings before they would escape the house. They saw Salman 
with I think one garment, a book, the Quran, a copy of the Quran and a bowl, a plate that he would eat from. That's all he had in his house. Look at how humble he is. When he was seen fleeing that area because of the fire, he said one powerful word. Salman said, Najal Mukhifun. Those who are light have achieved success and they've been saved. What does he mean by that? Those who are light, they're saved. He doesn't have any worldly longings. He's talking about the Akhirah. The day of judgment. See, their fire broke out. On the day of judgment, there's that fire, right? He says, if you want to be saved on the day of judgment, travel light. Don't have a lot of sins burdening you. Don't have too much worldly attachments slowing you down. Beautiful words from Salman. He was really an amazing companion to the Prophet Yes, sister. Say, is this Salman al farisi I, I, I heard a story He's the one that, uh, that was talking how when we die, what happens to us? He talked to the dead, yes. To dead. Salman was given special knowledge by the Prophet ﷺ. We'll refer to that hadith shortly. Salman was told by the Prophet ﷺ that before you die, there's going to be a sign that indicates your death is near. One day he got sick. He was uh, pretty ill. So he told one of his friends, I feel ill and I don't, I want to know if I'm going to die in this illness or not. Take me to the cemetery. Take me on my bed because he couldn't move to the cemetery. I want to know if I'm about to die. The Prophet gave me a sign. He told me, Salman, right before you die, you'll talk to the dead. So they take him to the cemetery. Salman addresses the people of the cemetery. Oh, Ahl al Qubur, oh, Ahl la ilaha illallah, oh, people of the cemetery, <coughs> talk to me. No one responds. Again, he says, Talk to me, oh, you who have passed this world. You're now in the Akhirah. I am Salman, the companion of the Prophet. And the Prophet is truthful. He doesn't lie. He told me, Salman, before you die, you're going to talk to the dead. I feel as if death is probably coming to me. Talk to me. When he says that, a young man, um, I think the hadith does indicate he was youthful, who had died early. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrects him, he gives life to him, he emerges out of his grave and he speaks to Salman. Salman asks him, tell me, are you amongst the people whom God forgave and you had faith or you're amongst the people of hell? He tells him, no Salman, Allah had mercy on me, Allah forgave me because I died with faith and I had good deeds. Salman tells him, describe death to me. You should read that conversation. Can you send it to us? Between Salman, I, I have the Arabic. I'll send you the Arabic, we'll see if we can translate it or one of the brothers can translate it for us. It's maybe two, three pages long. He tells him step by step what happened, how the angel of death came, how he looked like, what questions were asked, when he fell in the grave, how he felt that fall into the grave and all the checkpoints and all the incidents that happened in the world of Barzakh and then how his soul was taken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked to his soul. He talks about all that, it's a very interesting conversation, it's pretty long. It's recorded, like it's recorded, yes. He was saying it, It's very long. Part of it, yes, does have that. I want the writing part. I want yes. you to find me the one that he talks. About. I'll send you the whole entire hadith. Read the details. They're very interesting. They're very, very interesting, and it does have that supplication that's uh, very helpful at the time of death. So, Salman, after this incident of talking to the dead. He realizes, okay, my time's up. Shortly after, he passes away. He passes away where? In Madain. He passes away in Madain and he had prepared a kafan for himself, a shroud, where you kaf you kafan nafsak, right? The coffin, or not the coffin, the shroud. Salman had written these Arabic lines of poetry on his kafan. It shows you how much hope he had in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَفَتُّ عَلَى الْكَرِيمِ بِغَيْرِ زَادٍ I have come to visit the Kareem, the generous, without any Zad. 
Zaad in Arabic is the provisions that you need when you travel. Like back then there weren't motels or restaurants on the way. If you travel, you need to take the food with you. He says, I am going to the Kareem, to the generous, but I have nothing with me. I don't have any provisions. من الحسنات والقلب السليم. I don't have those hasanat that I really need. I don't have that قلب السليم, that pure heart. وحمل الزاد أقبح كل شيء إذا كان الوفود على الكريم. He says it's inappropriate that when you visit someone who's generous, that you take your food with you. So Allah, I'm coming empty-handed. I have nothing, but I have your generosity. He writes these lines of poetry. It's also mustahab for us to write these lines or to make in our will for this to be written in our kafan. So he dies in Madain. This is in the year 36 after the Hijrah. So we're talking about, you know, some 25 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Salman dies, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam instantaneously, miraculously, comes to Madain. The Imam alayhi salam appears in Madain. The Imam is the one who prepares him for burial. The Imam is the one who, you know, prays on him and he even buries him. And the Imam came from where? From Medina at the time. The Imam had not relocated to Kufa. This is before the Khilafah of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now the distance between Madain and Medina is very, very big distance. I don't have an exact, um, you know, Distance, but let's say maybe a thousand miles, right? It's very long distance. It's like going from Medina to Kufa or Baghdad. So the Imam alayhi salam, right when Salman died, the Imam came from Medina by Allah's permission to Madain in order to attend the burial of Salman. He really had a lot of virtues. He was truly a great man of virtues. He had special knowledge from the Prophet. And Imam Sadiq alayhi salam mentions this. The Prophet, he himself says in one hadith, لا تغلطن في سلمان Nobody should accuse Salman of saying anything that's wrong or any inaccurate. فإن الله تبارك وتعالى أمرني أن أطلعه على علم البلايا والمنايا والأنساب وفصل الخطاب. Allah has commanded me to give special علم الغيب, knowledge of the unseen to Salman. He really had the highest faith of all companions. In one hadith, Imam al-Sadiq says, imagine Iman is 10 degrees or levels. Miqdad is in the 8th degree of Iman. Abu Dhar is in the 9th and Salman is at the 10th. He was the top companion of the Prophet Another hadith by Anas ibn Malik. Remember, Anas was not a supporter of the Ahlul Bayt. He was a companion of the Prophet. He said, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله إن الجنة تشتاق إلى ثلاثة Paradise longs, yearns for three. علي وعمار وسلمان Just imagine the sheer faith of Salman for the Prophet to say this. That Jannah misses Salman, it's waiting for him. In fact, Salman was also amongst those who foretold about Karbala the events of Karbala, and even those shuhada who, are, who will fall in Karbala. Lady Fatima السلام, had a lot of respect for him. He was one of only few companions, like others like Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, who actually had the honor of being called by the Prophet or Imam Ali to go to the house of Lady Fatima and privately learn knowledge from her. Nobody had that. Benefit. Lady Fatima, she wouldn't mean men, she would not meet men and companions during the life of the Prophet. She was in her house. But Salman was one of those few who was granted special permission to enter the house of Lady Fatima and directly get knowledge from Lady Fatima. And he was a staunch supporter of Lady Fatima. He would always attribute himself to the Prophet. In a very beautiful hadith, one, one time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa in the masjid of the Prophet, a number of companions were sitting and they were boasting about their ancestry. I come from this ancestry, my father is this, my tribe is that. And then 
those people in the Masjid of the Prophet, they didn't really know who Salman was. Maybe let's say they were newcomers to Islam. So this man looked like Persian. Who is he? Is he a foreigner? Is he an outsider? So they asked him, Salman, we told you our tribes and to which tribes we belong. Tell us about your ancestry and your tribe. Where do you come from? Salman stood up and he told them, Ana ibn al-Islam. I, I want my ancestry, I'm the son of Islam. Kuntu dhalan fahadani Allahu bi Muhammad. I was on the other path when Allah guided me through Muhammad. I was poor, Allah enriched me through Muhammad. I was owned as a slave, Allah gave me my freedom through Muhammad. That's my ancestry. I'm the son of Islam, I am of Muhammad. That's why Imam al-Sadiq in one hadith, he says, don't say Salman al-Farisi. Don't say Salman the Persian, say Salman al-Muhammadi. He is attributed to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this is Salman. He was truly an amazing, an amazing companion of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he really stayed true to the Ahl al-Bayt. He supported the Ahl al-Bayt after the Prophet. Any questions on Salman? Yes, sister. Um, how old was he? That's an interesting question. We don't know his exact age. We have multiple hadiths about his age. But sources, Sunni and Shia sources indicate his age at the time was at least 250. Yes, so he, he lived a long, long life. And remember, this is not impossible, you know, in the past, the Quran and Hadith do tell us about people who lived a long time. <laughs> So he did live at least 250. Remember, he, remember when I was telling you about his migrations? The guy, I mean, spent decades sometimes maybe in some of these villages and areas. So when you look at his journey to the Prophet, realize Salman was searching for truth for centuries. Appreciate, you know, what he, the sacrifice that, yeah, it wasn't like a few months or years. Decades and decades he would not give up. That's why they call him the first Muslim, like a Muslim before there was Islam. He was a Muslim in his heart because he submitted to Allah, yes. So I don't have an exact age, some say 250, some say 300, some say 350. But scholars, even Sunni scholars have said, what's for sure <coughs> is that he was at least 250. When he passed? <coughs> yes. Oh, how old was he when he um, like found the Prophet? Well, he, he died in the year 36. So he <coughs> lived 25 years after the Prophet. So he was old at the time. So when he met the Prophet, that was his last part of his life. Yeah. So he's lived most of his life before the, the Islam, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu A'lam. You know, we really don't know. Yeah, that, exactly. <coughs> he lived a very, very long time. What, what's what? <coughs> in Madain. Today if you go to Iraq for ziyarah, Madain is not too far from Karbala and Baghdad. You can take a day trip, go to Madain. He does actually have a shrine. You can visit the grave of Salman. He's buried in the city of Madain in Iraq.